Good morning, everybody. It's just me, PJ here, coming to you from the living room. And as you are in your living room, I hope that this day finds you wonderful, absolutely filled with joy and peace and all the good things that God wants to bring your way. Good morning, Shana and Donna and uh, those of you. I'll try to keep up with you just to, to warn you. Sometimes those go so fast and I don't have my glasses on. Good morning, Anita and Shirley and Shelly. Love you, babe. And uh, so I may miss something along the way, but it doesn't mean I don't love you. And uh, just try to say good morning when I can. Good morning, Don, Tammy, and all of you. So um, I'll try to kind of keep up with it as I can. Good morning, Donna. Uh, but I, I'm just a little ADD, so when I get into the message, I might skip somebody. So please forgive me if I do. And if I skip you, say have good morning to each other. Good morning, Steve, Austin. And uh, just make sure you talk to each other. And Will and... Uh, Hi, Faye. Hey, it's good to see Faye and Dave last night. They were dropping off some money to the pig, and and uh, it was good to, to, to see you guys over there. And Ray and Evie are up there watching, and uh, boy, I sure do miss all of you guys. Um, you know, good morning, Mike. Uh, morning, Dave and Abby. Hello. Good morning to you, Abby and Cindy and, and uh, the puppy dog there and the pug, Linda and Greg and Bruce and uh, Amber and Nancy and Heather and Bill and Anybody else that's that's watching? Good morning to all of you. So, just wanted to start out with a few things this morning. Uh, a couple of things. Good morning, Dave. Um, wanted to uh, to say that we um, are working on something for next week. Um, hello, Wayne and Sarah and kids. Um, so please, uh, good morning, Ruth. Say hi to Don for me as well. Hi, Jane. So working on something for next week. But uh, again, I've got to get a few more permissions um the good news this morning hey debbie hey how you guys doing hey don debbie and don and uh, uh scott good morning i got good news this morning i woke up and i had a um a little uh, indicator that my uh, uh shipment had been made of the um the fm transmitter so um i was able to find to track down a transmitter and uh i got it ordered and amazon says it's shipped so it's coming here, so we're hoping um, that we can work some things out so that next week we can have a little closer social distancing. So um, so be um, praying about that, praying for the phone calls I need to make this week to, uh, to try to get all of that put together. And uh, if I do um, get the permission I'm looking for to make that happen, then I'll be calling some of you because we'll need some people to help set some things up set some things out and uh, just kind of do the logistics to make it happen. So we're, I'm excited about what that can lead to and, and what we can do and how we can, how we can be uh, alone together, separated, but really a lot closer than we have been sort of. Good morning, Keila. Good morning, Lisa. So, um, so be in prayer for that. Uh, a few other things I wanted to uh, let you know about. I wanted you to be praying for hello from out family. Um, Please be praying. My friend Ben that I talked to this week, um, this past week, I talked to him on the phone a little bit. And we were talking about some things, and uh, I did not know this, but his mom um, was a diabetic and that they had found her unconscious and unresponsive in a diabetic coma. And uh, she's in a nursing home now and has and not been doing real well, and it's left uh, a lot of work for uh, Ben and his sister. So please be praying for uh, Ben Osterman's mom, Janet. I uh, just ask that you be praying for for her and for Ben, and uh, and their family as they as they deal with that. Also, uh, talked to uh, had an awesome conversation this week with uh, with uh, Gary and Melinda Holsoppel, and uh, Gary's quite the guitar builder extraordinaire. And uh, I get to watch Gary every week uh, or every week that he sends me the link for it um, playing bass. And uh, he plays bass for Chapel and Guam. They're doing social distancing and but they're doing worship and stuff. So he's still doing that. And, uh, but I found out that there's a big need in Guam right now for the, um, sailors. There's, I haven't heard much of this in the news. I've watched a lot of the coverage for a lot of this, but I haven't heard it, but they're right there on the base with these soldiers And Guam is a very small Island. And there's 900 soldiers who are now uh, positive for COVID-19 who are off the ship. You know, that's a ship. I think it was five or 6,000 on that ship. <laughs> Um, I think it was 5,000. So 900 soldiers right now are being um, put. Good morning, Joyce. Um, if you're outside your mom's window, hi, Ruth. 
uh, and tell Ruth, I said, I, and Jeff, praying for you as well. Hey, morning, Kim. How you doing, buddy? Um, <clears throat> I need you to play a little guitar for me here. Get some music going here. Morning, Fred. Uh, so anyway, so 900 of these soldiers are being housed off the ship, and they are being housed in like a school gym, uh, some, some extra space that they found, and one of the spaces is a warehouse with no air conditioning. Guam is like 90 plus every day, you know, up into the hundreds. So please uh, be praying for those soldiers who are quarantined. The other 4,000 soldiers are basically being housed in hotels, kind of up, you know, as all the rooms are being taken up. So it's just, and it, oddly enough, it's been a situation where um, you wouldn't think it with the military, but a lot of these soldiers, because they weren't expecting to be off the ship this long, are out of some of their basic needs, like hygiene needs. They're, they're washing their own clothes. Um, and Gary, basically, long story short, is they've been trying to meet the needs. And the, the, uh, the chaplain for the base, who's got Nazarene roots, and Gary's connecting, Melinda, we're connecting with them. Um, so what they've been trying to do is just raise money wherever they can to go and literally purchase. And there's not a lot of places to purchase stuff, but they've been place, purchasing clotheslines so they can wash their own clothes and hang them up to dry them because there's so many soldiers and they're so overwhelmed that they just can't keep up with some of those basic needs and you know and toothpaste and soap and those things that you can't and i asked gary about you know the military and he said this is just such a complicated process to requisition stuff because there was no sort of supply chain in place for this and all those sort of things so these soldiers are really um struggling to get by with this and even some of the people on base gary shared with me there's a a mother who's <clears throat> and a couple kids on base who who were packed out you know the military sends and when you're shifting uh, to, to different stations good morning MJ and Jimmy and Shelly and all of you and Ari so um, <clears throat> so they were all their stuff was packed out of their house and then this whole thing hit the quarantine hit and so they were left in a house where they had no beds um, they had no pots and pans and dishes basically everything was taken out of their house they were sh scheduled to, to move to the new location, um, and then the, now they're stuck there, and they have to be there, and they literally have nothing in the house. So uh, things like that have been going on over in Guam. So I just wanted to make you aware of that and some of those needs, and I'm going to talk to you a little bit later um, about a way that we can try to hope, uh, hopefully meet some of those needs right here from little old Columbia in Ohio. So good morning, Mike. Good morning, um, morning guys. All right, so uh, a couple other things I want us to be praying for. Uh, many of you know Jim and Charlotte McLaughlin, Jim's brother Len, his wife Peggy passed away um, this week. So we want to be remembering them. And Linda Kalina's cousin Kathy has passed away. Continue to remember her. I know that we've been praying for Dr. Uchino. Um, I don't know <coughs> um, what the update on him is. Um, he was dealing with a case of COVID, and so we just want to keep praying for him. Keep praying for uh, Brenda Parsley. That's Misty, er uh, Misty Allison's mom and uh, she's just been very very sick and dealing with a lot and it's really really put a lot of stress on misty and we just want to be lifting up misty and 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 her family in this time of, of need and just just be asking god to meet their needs uh best brother donnie i'm still requiring more surgeries and i know there's a lot of other needs on there i'm kind of been pulling some of these off of the prayer request list um and trying to to watch those um you know we need to continue to pray for uh, jim and charlotte and danny and crystal and Sue and Denny and uh, Don and Ruth are home. And by the way, I said hi to Don. Don and Ruth are home. So that's a prayer of praise. You know, they made it home from Arizona finally after being sort of, you know, you know most, many of us would think that it's a good thing to be stuck in Arizona. But when you're out there in Arizona and it's over 100 degrees and, and everybody else went home and hides in air conditioning, you know, it's probably better to be in Ohio. So we're glad that they're home as well. And I know there's other requests. Uh, one thing I wanted to shout out to, which is a real praise, and if you didn't uh, know it, Make sure you uh, call them or send them a card. It is the 45th anniversary for Bill and Bonnie Grimm, and we are congratulating them. I know there's been a lot of birthdays. You know, Jane Barnes had a birthday last week, and there's others of you, and, and I've been trying to keep up with most of you on Facebook where I can and stuff. So I'm just so glad that you guys uh, are praying for each other, encouraging one another, loving on each other. That's so awesome, and let's just keep doing it. Uh, good morning, Beth. Um, good morning, Ken, if you're there also as well, and Ken Senior, if you're there watching. So, all right. Well, I love you guys, and uh, let's just go ahead and say a prayer for all these requests and uh, get some things rolling here. Dear Heavenly Father, we just thank you for this day to be together, that we, even in this uh, time of uh, isolation and somewhat of separation, that 
that you've given us some blessed days like yesterday where we can be out walking and enjoying the incredible beauty of your creation and and in those times when we catch glimpses of each other or, or drive-bys or drive up to houses or at least get to see see each other in the flesh and uh, you know we you know we long to hug on each other and to just to be together and to worship together and but Lord, we just know that uh, that in your time that you will work all these things out. And we are just trusting you. Lord, we are trusting you for all the needs we mentioned and those that weren't mentioned, but they're there. And you know them. And, and I pray that everyone here in the sound of my voice right now would be lifting up the prayer request you put on their heart. And that you would be um, praying. And, and I think of the Eversons even this morning and Keith's daughter and, and, and others, Lord, that I, I might have missed. But you've laid prayers on each and every one of our hearts for us specifically to intercede for and to carry to the throne. And so we ask that every one of us would be faithful and diligent to do the work of prayer. Lord, it isn't, uh, you know, a preparation. It is a work. It is an incredible work. And, and more gets done through the power of your people coming together to pray than all the, the organization and all the, uh, the plans of, of men and, and, and organizations, Lord. If we would just humble ourselves, as your word says, and, and call upon your name, Lord, we know that you will move. You want to do great and mighty things for us, for your glory and your honor. And so we just ask that you would keep us faithful to make our hearts a place of prayer and our homes a home of prayer and a house of prayer and your glory and your honor. We just love you this day. We give you all the thanks and the praise, and we know that in all things that you are lifted up, and we pray that you would be glorified and honored in our lives and that you would draw others into yourself. In your precious name we pray, amen. All right, so I said we're going to try to do something about Guam, um, and I really honestly, morning, Nikki. I haven't said a whole lot on these things about um, offering. You guys have continued to feed the pig, which is awesome. Um, I didn't get over quite early enough to get the pig out before I uh, started this morning, but uh, the pig will be out. And again, I'm reminding you, most days, like Monday through Friday, even on Saturdays, the front door of the church is open. The pig is either on the porch or inside. But more importantly, I'm just inviting you to kind of come in and just look around a little bit. You know, we're really getting close upstairs. And I debated about taking the, the phone, and I might just do a little video after this um, sometime today. Just do a little tour video and show you some of the woodwork Ken's got up and the painting Don's gotten done. And uh, just really uh, anticipating getting getting this really, really close. Good morning, Teresa. How are you doing? Um, so we're just hoping and excited about what's going on there. So this is what I would like us to do. I'd like us to be, uh, you guys responded so incredibly to be a giving church where not only have we met all the, uh, the, the goals that we've set for ourselves with faith promise uh, to support missions and missionaries around the world and Alabaster, you guys gave over $400 to Alabaster, been doing reports this week, so these numbers are fresh. Um, I'm excited about that. But this is, I asked Gary and Melinda, what can we do to help the soldiers in Guam? You can't really pack stuff up and send it over there uh, it's just, it's too far. It really is in the middle of nowhere. So this is what I'd like us to do, is to take an offering up for the soldiers in Guam. And I've talked to Gary and Melinda. What we can do is if we'll take an offering today, um, I'll probably take it from now through Wednesday. Um, we'll take those offerings, give you a chance to think about what you might want to do. If you write a check or if you put it in an envelope and you drop it off, make sure you mark Guam on there. So I know that that's for the Guam soldiers. Um, if you want to give online, if you go to cncfamily.net, there's the three little bars at the top corner. Let's see, I think, I think the phone shows me backwards, so if I'm doing this, I think it's your right, I don't know, or my left, or I don't know. Anyway, so there's three little bars up there, and when you click that, there's a giving link, and when you click the giving link, if you scroll down through almost to the end, it says monthly missions specials. If you give online, put it under monthly missions specials, and then I will make sure, and if there's a place to add a note there, just any place where you can write in, um, which I can't remember if there's a place to write in a special instructions or notes, but if it is, put Guam in there. But if you put it under monthly mission specials in the online giving tab, then I'll make sure any money that comes in from now till Monday or till Wednesday on that, that we give all of that to the soldiers of Guam. And then Gary and Melinda and the chaplain, um, uh, Chaplain Lee, um, I believe is his name, um, they will go out and they will use that. But they've been doing this for the last four weeks, just basically nonstop, you know, getting any resources, funds they can, and just trying to provide for the soldiers and for the families who've kind of been stuck in the middle on the base there in Guam. So if you want to do that, that would be awesome. All righty then. 
So, um, so this morning we're going to be in the book of Luke. I know that you know that we've been there. Um, hey, Bonnie Forney, how are you doing? Um, so we're in the book of Luke, Luke chapter 7. I know it's like the third week of chapter 7, but there's a lot in there. Um, and so Luke chapter 7, starting with verse 36. So get in your Bibles. I'm giving you a chance to open up um, your, your uh, Bibles and get there. I also want to give a shout out to... Virgil. Virgil uh, is over at Whispering Pines. Virgil got there just as the shutdown happened. So uh, so if you get a chance, give Virgil a call or, or send him a card. Um, he's watching online with us. He's been watching um, either the YouTube or the live. I'm not sure how. But um, and Virgil, look, I've got a white shirt on so you can see me better. So Virgil was giving me some, some good advice. So And also uh, Roger and Heidi, just the rest of the family as well. Just, just keep just don't forget everybody. Just, just stay in touch. So at any rate, um, so as you're turning there in the Bible to, uh, to the book of Luke, uh, I wanted to talk to you just a little bit um, about relationships. You see, I think in relationships, we tend to act out of um, two different modes, two different sort of motivations. And, and you, you all out there have been in some sort of relationship, so you can identify with them. It's, Hello, Shelly. Uh, not my Shelly, but the other Shelly, Shelly Hopkins. So, um, so see if this resonates with you or, or if this sounds familiar. So maybe you're in a relationship with somebody. Now there's two motivations. One motivation is to give. You know, there are those people and you guys know who they are. And, and uh, most of you are those people who, who you, you get into a relationship with somebody. And it's, I'm not just talking like romance, like boyfriend, girlfriend, that kind of, I mean, just any kind of relationship in a friendship or, or it's family. And you know that person who's just the giver. They just, they just long to give. They just, there's no request that they don't try to meet and there's nothing that they won't try to do. And, and not only do you, I mean, you don't even have to ask. They're just, they're looking, they're aware and they're sensitive to some, to needs and they're just, they want to give. They just want to do, they want to, they want to serve. They just, not to get something back, but just, they just genuinely Mo are motivated by their love for others and in that relationship tend to just give out of that out of that sense of love and that motivation now there's another kind of relationship and you guys are probably are familiar with this one as well they are the mo those motivated to get they're not motivated to give they're motivated to get and the relationship is you know defined by like what have you done for me lately or hey i did this for you now you got to do this for me and folks, and I tell you, I've seen people try to live marriages that way. Not a good way to live a marriage. Hey, I did the dishes. Now you got to do this. Hey, I did this. Now you got to do that. Hey, I did, you know, but just, it goes way beyond marriage. It's friendships. It's oftentimes, you know, it's like those working relationships and peers that we work with. And, and you guys know enough about those two relationships that you know the kind of relationship you want to be. You want to be yourself, but more importantly, you know the kind of relationship you long to be in. And that relationship is the one that says, how can I serve? How can I minister? How can I give? We have givers. You're right, Shelly. We have givers at CNC, those giver relationships. And I'm, I, I just, I brag on you guys all the time. I just want you to know, this week I was out and about and uh, talking to different individuals, looking at tree jobs and things. I was in a, you know, probably a very long conversation with a young man, an awesome guy uh, yesterday. But we had such a great relationship or uh, conversation about the the realities of of what church is and you know and you know as, as most people around here do he had a connection that kind of went back to the Nazarene church but he talked about how it's not about the, this false you know not about ritual and and being one way and, and his words where he says you know that I'm I am who I am all the time and and how he had a disdain for people who are you know, I'm with you Monday, you know, through Friday, and I'm working with you, and you're this person. Well, then I see you, you know, on a Sunday at your church, and you're like, who is this person? And that's sort of that giver versus the getter kind of person and those motivations. Um, generally, our motivation precedes our actions. So how we act towards one another, the things that we do with or the things we do for each other are really motivated by those sort of that, that general um tendency of being a give love or a get love kind of person. Good morning, Joanne. I tell Fred to get up. Oh, he's, he's got on here before you are, so I guess I can't give him a hard time. So, um, you know, politicians, I, you know, I just use this so you can just get a better sense for this. Politicians, um, they often make the same promises. You know, they're all promising the same actions, you know, 
you know, chicken in every pot, um, you know, uh, money in every bank account, uh, a roof over every head. But, but I think, unfortunately, there's a very small, there's a very small percentage, but some politicians make those promises of action out of, they really want to make the world a better place. They really want to do something to help their fellow human beings. They, they are making promises of, of what they will do if they get elected because they truly have a desire to make the world a better place. That's kind of a minority. But most politicians that, that we're familiar with today, unfortunately, because of sort of corruption and human nature, most politicians make promises to get votes. And they will promise you anything and everything because their motivation isn't to make the world a better place. <laughs> it's to make their life better by getting in a position. And so they will promise you things motivated that if I promise you this, or if I take that action, you vote for me. And it's a totally different dynamic. And I think well, I wanted to share that with you because I think in the scripture today, Luke chapter seven, start with verse 36, we see Jesus sort of diving into it and looking at this great difference between the those who are lo love out of give and those who love out of get and the actions taken to give and the actions taken to get starting up there with verse 36 um says this when one of the pharisees invited jesus to have dinner with him he went to the pharisee's house and reclined at the table a woman in that town who lived a sinful life learned that jesus was eating at the pharisee's house so she came there with an alabaster jar of perfume as she stood behind him at his feet weeping, she began to wet his feet with her tears. Then she wiped them with her hair, kissed them, and poured perfume on them. When the Pharisee who had invited him saw this, he said to himself, If this man were a prophet, he would know who is touching him and what kind of woman she is, that she is a sinner. Well, Jesus answered him, Simon, I have something to tell you. Tell me, teacher, he said. Two people owed money to a certain moneylender. One owed 500 denarii and the other 50. Neither of them had the money to pay him back, so he forgave the debts of both. Now, which of them will love him more? Simon replied, I suppose the one who had the bigger debt forgiving. You have judged correctly, Jesus said. Wow. Who will love him more? The one who had the bigger debt. The different response from the debtors here, the different response isn't from the action that was taken. Because the lender didn't differentiate between 50 and 500. The one who, who wiped out the debt said, looked at them both as having a debt. Um, why did Jesus say which will love him more, the one who was forgiven the 500 or the one who was given the 50? Because it's in our recognition of our debt that motivates the level of gratitude or the level of, of love, Jesus uses the word here, which will love him more, which will be more grateful, which one will, will, will understand the expression of love they received more. The one who owed 50 or the one who owed 500. Now, think about that for, for just a minute. Um, you know, you know um, the stimulus money, okay? You know, everybody's supposed to be getting a stimulus check. You know, I haven't gotten a stimulus check, but that's okay. I don't need it. Um, if they send it to me, I'll, I'll find a good use for it. But think about it in terms of um, if you were, if you literally had um, $5 to your name, okay? Five dollars. You've got five kids. You've got five dollars. A wife, two dogs, a cat, and a goldfish. Okay, the mortgage is due. There's no food in the house. Um, they're threatening to turn off the electricity. They're threatening to. Uh, they're threatening to turn off the electricity. They're shutting off the water. I mean, you're going to have no showers, no toilets, no food, no heat, no none of those things. And and you've got five dollars left to your name. And you, all of a sudden, in your bank account, there is $1,200 deposited for you. You didn't do anything to earn it. You didn't ask for it. It's just $1,200, boom, in your, in your bank account. Now, would that mean a lot to you, to, to be facing the, all of that doom and gloom, to have $5 in it, and all of a sudden, you've got $1,200 to meet the needs of your 
five kids and your spouse and your two dogs and your goldfish and, and you're able to put some food on the table and, and find a way to survive just a little while longer. And that, that $1,200 would mean a lot to you. But imagine if you're sitting at home and your bills are all caught up, you, uh, you've got a surplus in your bank account, you've got so much food in the fridge that you're deciding what you should throw away because it's outdated. Um, you're trying to, you know, like, oh, I can't get anything else in this freezer. You know, you're the person who gets up early and gets the chicken at Sam's Club and you bought all the hamburgers and the meat up and, and you bought all the toilet paper, or you bought all the paper towels and you bought all the hand washers. Um, hey Kim, how are you doing? It's good to see you this morning. So if you're that person and your your only thing that you're worried about is that, you know, you lost 5% from your 401k and your investments and then all of a sudden you get $1,200 in your bank account on top of the 10,000 that was already there, well, what does that $1,200 mean to you? Oh, hey, you know, yeah, maybe I, I can go to Chick-fil-A like three times this week, you know, or you buy some more uh, toilet paper and stock up a little bit more, you know. That $1,200 to you, it doesn't really mean much because it's not really meeting any needs. And I would say that, that what Jesus was saying here was the response between the two people wasn't the fact that that one had 500 forgiven and one had 50 forgiven. I mean, I mean, well, it is, but it's the recognition of their need. It's the their ability to look at themselves and say, "This is where my this is the level of my need, and this is the level of God's supply, far and above what I could ever even think or expect or ask." And that is what is really important to me in this passage here is that that Jesus is kind of saying to this Pharisee that it's not about the level of sin and the amount of sin or the sinfulness. It's about the recognition in your own life of your need for forgiveness. And because we know that, you know, and, and I was doing some research this week and different people have different views on different levels of sin and is all sin the same? And there's all kinds of perspectives and theologies, but here's the thing, sin separates us from God. And whether it's a little bit of sin that separates you or a lot of sin, what's the difference? You know, it's like I've said to you before, if the, if the speed limit is 55 and you go 56 and your neighbor is driving 85, who's the greater lawbreaker? You've both broken the law. It doesn't matter whether you've broken it a lot or broken it a little, it's whether or not your life will keep you from the presence of God. And that's one of the things that we're looking at. So uh, Jesus going on from there in verse 44, brings this home to the Pharisee and to the woman who is there um, washing his feet with her tears and drying her, his feet with her hair. And we go on from there and it says this. It says, then, verse uh, 44, then he turned toward the woman and said to Simon, do you see this woman? I came into your house. You did not give me any water for my feet, but she wet my feet with her tears and wiped them with her hair. You did not give me a kiss, but this woman from the time I entered has not stopped kissing my feet. You did not put oil on my head, but she has poured perfume on my feet. Therefore, I tell you, her many sins have been forgiven as her great love has shown. And you notice there Jesus says, let me back up there. He says, as you, uh, he says, I tell you, her many sins have been, past tense, already been giving, given as her great love has shown. And it's in her recognition that Jesus has forgiven her, that she expresses her love through these actions. She isn't doing these things to get Jesus to forgive her. Jesus has already, we don't know the interaction. We don't know what has taken place before. But in here, there's this sense and this idea that Jesus is saying, she's already been forgiven. She's already done. Um, uh, and Linda, just so you know, if it didn't say go on, that's all right. Um, uh, just as long as you put it in approved mission or uh, monthly mission special, we'll get it. So anyway, so here's this woman. She's already been forgiven. She's already done it. And that gratitude, the recognition of, of the depth and the level of her need and the fact that Jesus has forgiven her, that's what, it's the recognition of her need and the recognition of his grace that motivates her giving nature, that motivates her expression of love, that motivates it. And Jesus said to her, he says, 
Uh, he says, so her many sins have been forgiven as her great love has shown. And her love is the expression of what she understands to be true, that she has been forgiven. And he says, but whoever has been forgiven little, loves little. Wow. Whoever has been forgiven little, loves little. That's, that's an incredible statement when we look at who we are as the body of Christ. It's an incredible, it's an incredible indictment for, for the body of Christ. And then Jesus said to her, your sins are forgiven. And the other guests began to say among themselves, who is this who even forgives sins? Jesus said to the woman, your faith has saved you. Now go in peace. Morning, Denise. Morning, Rick. Your faith has saved you. Now go in peace. Um, did Jesus call me to a different life of obedience because he called me to be a pastor? Did Jesus call Joe Schreffler? Joe. Good morning, Joe. You better be on there. Um, did God call Joe to a different level because he, he works um, as a janitor? Did God call Zach Barnes to a different level of obedience because he's called Zach, you know, to go into the service and become an electrician? Do each of us have a different level of obedience, a different level of love? Do we have, did we need a different level of grace? Did we need a different level of forgiveness? Mm, I think the answer to that would be no. Um, I think Christ calls all of us to the same life of faith. He calls Christians, he says, if you love me, obey my commands. And he says that, that our love is going to be seen and our, and our, our connectedness to him, our kinship with him is literally seen through our fellowship with him. And that fellowship with him is reproduced in the fellowship that we have with each other. You, you know, John, 1 John, he says, anybody who says they love God and hates their brother is a liar. Because he says, you can't love God and hate somebody that he's created, your brother and sisters. You can't hate this other human being and say that you love God, their father. It doesn't work that way. And Jesus has called all of us to the same life of faith. But it's interesting to me that it seems that in the body of Christ or in Christianity or in the church or the institution of the church, there seems to often be different levels of of commitment or expressions of love. <clears throat> Good morning, Charlie. Um, so, so what would that be? Um, this Pharisee is sitting here, and this Pharisee says, "Hey, <clears throat> you got to tell me." And he's why did he invite Jesus? He didn't invite Jesus because he was hoping that Jesus would forgive him. He didn't invite Jesus because he was feeling like, "Oh man, you know what a horrible sinner I am." He invited Jesus because he says, "Hey." I'm a Pharisee. I'm I'm the guy. I'm the man. I, I I'm the 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 you know I'm the the Mac Daddy to go back to an old phrase. And so he said, I want to bring Jesus into my house so I can examine him to see if I think he's worthy. <coughs> and he brought Jesus in, thinking that I go to church every Sunday. I give my tithe. I I sing the right songs. I wear the right clothes. I I do the right things. I go to the right places. I uh, I condemn the right people. He thought that he already was good he thought he was saved he thought he was righteous he thought he was holy sanctified <coughs> sorry <clears throat> i'm not sick no fever no no fever i'm good so um so but this woman recognized her need she recognized that she she wasn't good enough to be in the presence of God, that, <clears throat> that she was missing something from her life, that she needed a different life and a different lifestyle. And she recognized that Jesus offered that to her. In the body of Christ, we have people who, who uh, you know, <clears throat> and it's been interesting since the whole COVID crisis here, you know, nobody's been able to go to church. Nobody's been able to physically walk in, you know, into their churches on Sundays, you know, the freedom of religion. Yeah, well, I see how long that lasted. You know, our fear of a virus ended ended what the devil hasn't been able to do in 2,000 years. He shut down every church in America, basically. And so, so, but before that, and again, we've talked about this a little bit. Before that, you had people who coming and gathering to worship with the body of Christ, gathering together with brothers and sisters, 
was important, but it wasn't always the most important. And if there was an opportunity to, to go do an activity or to go to the lake or to sleep in or to get some work done at home or, you know, do this extra thing or that extra thing, you know, it was church is good. Church gathering is good. Yeah, I love my family, but it's important. It's just not the most important thing in my life. And I, I'll get there when I have time. I'll get there next week or I'll get there the week after that or I'll do, you know, uh, I'll do this later. And, and yeah, you know, they've been talking about needing workers for VBS or workers for Upward or, or they need somebody to deliver meals and they need some of those things and and so it's like well yeah it's 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 uh, you know and you're right well it isn't the building but it is the the building exists as the church when we gather in it and it's the idea of gathering to extol each other and to exhort each other and to encourage each other and I can tell you right now and I think we're all feeling this the lack of gathering to Hebrews chapter 10 says do not <laughs> you know do not forget to assemble he says don't you know don't slack off assembling this summer in the habit why did why did the writer of Hebrews say that because there's such value in our community of gathering that's important and it doesn't have to be on a Sunday morning but folks we haven't been able to gather not only on a Sunday morning most people only take the effort to come on Sunday morning because you know they think it should do it but that shouldn't be where we gather only where we gather as a church it should be a part of it it should be coming together it should be coming together in our homes it should be coming together at the store it should be coming together at the schools it should be coming together at workplaces but that coming together that sense of urgency and need to be connected to the body of Christ seems to to vary based on our sense of need or the sense of value that we have in it for this Pharisee he didn't feel like there was much of a need for forgiveness he didn't feel like there was a whole lot of need for he, he was good man he was good but this woman came in and she recognized that, that she was a sinner you know I, I grew up not in church but I grew up reading the word I, I grew up feeling an incredible closeness to God and yet in my life I still recognize I'm not good <laughs> I'm not able to save myself. I need the love of God. I need the grace and I need the grace of Christ. And I need the cross of Christ to redeem me, to restore me. And when I realize the level of my need, not because I'm a, um, I'm a drug addict or a derelict or a murderer or a thief or a liar, I recognize it because without God, I'm not complete. If I don't have the love of Christ in my heart, in my life, if I don't have the grace of the cross, filling me with the Spirit of God, that I am in need, that I am in lack, that I am in want. And we've got to get to the place where we recognize it's not about whether being a good person gets you to heaven. It's about whether or not you are loving Jesus because of what he's given you, not because of what you want him to give you, not because of what you want to get. It's whether or not you're gathering as the body of Christ, not because it's your duty, not because the pastor said so, not because my mom or dad will beat me up if I don't say, you know, they'll give me a hard time if I don't show up to church every Sunday. It's this intense passion and desire to say, I need that body. I need that family. I, I need the body of Christ. I need to come together. I did love to serve. Give me something to do. Put something in my hand. Here am I. Send me. What do you need done? Who can I love? Who can I serve? Who? What needs can I meet? What can I do? Where can I go? How can I do it? I'll go to the lake next week or I'll go some other time or, or I'll go do that hobby later, man. This is eternal things we're talking about. Not here today and gone tomorrow. The eternal things. And folks, this woman represents to me this idea of this passion that Jesus, that our love for him and our relationship with him and our desire for him and our desire to serve and to meet the needs of others is all based on the recognition of our need for forgiveness, our need for grace. And if God has given me a lowly, wretched person like me that love and that grace and mercy, how can I do less for others? How can I sit at home? How can I sit back? How can I look to my own needs and not to the needs of others? How can I live in a get kind of relationship and not be the giver of love and of life and of hope and of the living water and of the word of God that feeds to the very soul of a person's needs? How can I not be that person? Jesus, in this story, in this recount, shows us, shows us, that it's not about what we get. It's about what we give because of what has been given. Jesus said her sins have been forgiven as her love shows. Do you know that your sins have been forgiven? Do you know that Jesus Christ has met your needs? 
then I just feel passionate in my own life that that I want to be the woman in this story. I want to be the woman who has wiped Jesus's feet with her tears and with her hair and anointed him with oil. I want to be the one in this story that doesn't say, well, I'm pretty good. You know, I, I do my part. I've been going to church for 50 years. I do the right things. I, yeah, man. You know, they better make, they better do the right thing by me or hmm, I'll tell you what. I want to be the person that says, Father, against you, David's heart. <laughs> David said, Father, against you, and you alone have I sinned. Create in me a clean heart. <laughs> Take not from me your Holy Spirit. Restore to me the joy my salvation. Psalm 51, David, after he had betrayed God with Bathsheba and murdered her husband, David says, whew, greatest king that ever lived in Israel. Yeah, I had approved problems, but hey, look at the rest of my story. No, David fell on his knees before God and said, Father, come back to me. Restore me. Renew that passionate love in my life. And I hope that that is where you and I are. James says it clearly. When tempted, no one should say, God is tempting me. James chapter 1, 13 through 14. For God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he tempt anyone. But each person is tempted when they are dragged away by their own evil and sin and desires and enticed. And then he says it grows into sin and sin grows into death. Sin is rooted in our hearts, but love is also rooted there. It's the spark of the divine, the imagio dei, as it says, that, that the image of God is stamped on our hearts. That is the root. That is the opportunity. Even though we are sinful people, that spark of love that is stamped in the image of who we are gives us the hope of responding and recognizing God's love for us and then being filled with his spirit and forgiven by his grace. Jesus gave one more example later on in Luke. He says, two men went to the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. The Pharisee stood by himself and prayed, God, I thank you, I'm not like other people, robbers, evildoers, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week and I give a tenth of all I get. But the tax collector stood at a distance. He would not even look up to heaven but beat his breast and said, God, have mercy on me, a sinner. I tell you, Jesus said, that this man, the one who cried for mercy rather than the other, who said, hey, look how good I am, went home justified before God. For all those who exalt themselves will be humbled, and those who humble themselves will be exalted. It's the same scenario. It's the recognition of our need that drives us into the depths of repentance and the realization our need for forgiveness and it's this realization of our forgiveness that defines the expression of our love don't have to tell me to get up <laughs> don't have to tell me to go don't have to tell me this person has a need don't have to tell me to form a committee and, and organize a drive and and you know put together you know uh, a date and all you know what the expression of our love is see the need and meet the need if you can't meet it by yourself, see the need and grab three or four brothers and sisters and say, here's a need that God's shown me. Let's, let's do this. Don't go out and buy the t-shirts. Don't call WKBN to, to, to interview you and to see how good a person you are. Just see the need and express out of your love for Christ, that love through the expression into the lives of others. I'm not judging anyone for what they do or how they do it. <coughs> But I am telling you, that's, that's how I see things. That's, that's how I, when I read scripture, that's, I got to tell you, that's, it seems to me to be the truth. And I'm willing to be corrected. I believe the contrast that we see in this passage and we see again and again, we see it throughout Christianity. We see those who, who want to be the biggest church on the block and we see those who want to be the biggest Christian on the block and we see those who want to be, you know, the, the most liked pastor or the most viewed pastor or this, you know, it's, it's, man, this is not a competition. This is not about who's right and who's wrong. It's about love. It's about loving God and loving others and, 
and seeing needs and meeting needs out of that love. Actions motivated by our love and gratitude for God and his grace may go unnoticed by the world, but they never go unnoticed by your heavenly daddy. Our actions motivated to guarantee that God must love us and extend his grace to us. Look, God, look what I did. Hey, look at me. Hey, look what a Christian I am. Hey, did you see what I gave last week? Did you see what I did? Did you? Hey, if you didn't, let me tell you. Let me tell you how good I am. And Jesus said, who are you? You cast out demons in my name? Oh, oh well, that's cool. You, you, built, you built schools and hospitals and churches in my name? Oh, well, you know, I saw some press releases about that, and I saw your name, but I, I'm, I don't know you. Depart from me. I don't know you. Actions motivated by our love for God. That's what this story is about. And the one who is justified is the one who acts out of love, not the one who acts to get God to love you. Both are rooted in our honest recognition of our true need for forgiveness and our true need for repentance. So I hope this morning that you are acting out of love. And it's something that we should examine ourselves and we should take the time and ask God, ask God, you know, this is a challenge to you. Ask God to examine your heart. Ask God to, to look into your life and to just show you those areas of your life where, where you want to be molded more into his image. Because it's not about you've been wrong. It's not about doing the wrong. Who's more Christian, less Christian, the better Christian, the lesser? No, it's, it's about being molded and shaped into the image of our Heavenly Father, the Imago Dei, being true to the true self that God created us to be and asking God to reveal to us the things that we hold on to that are keeping us from being closer to him, closer to each other, and molded more into his image. So I hope today and I hope this week that you find love, 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 and more love, and that your life is motivated by love, your life is filled with love, and your life is given to the kindness and to the acts of love that are the expression of God's grace and forgiveness that have already been received and realize in your life. May we be the church that acts in love, that serves in love, that, that exists in love, that is realized because we know we've already been forgiven. And if God can forgive me, folks, he can forgive any of us. And if he can love me, if he can love me, if he can love Will and Dave and Dave, and all the other guys out there, and all the other ladies, and all of us, all this CNC family. I mean, if God can love all of us, there's no limit to who he can love. And that's the good news, and that is what we must preach. Preach it. Every post, every live feed, every opportunity. Tell folks, God loves them, God's forgiven them. Let's pray. Father, thank you for this day. Thank you for this worship. Thank you for this time to dig deep into your word and realize your grace has been enough to save us. Whether our need is great or we see our need is little, the need is not important, Lord, right now. The, what is important is your grace and that your grace meets our needs. May we be those who don't get trapped into a false sense of, of pretty good or who's good or who's gooder. Lord, may we not get trapped into those false comparisons to one another. May we instead compare ourselves to you and to who it is you call us to be. May we not settle for lesser things, lesser attitudes. May we not settle for lesser actions, lesser love. May we be compelled, Lord, by your great love for us to seek to love as you've loved us and forgive as you've forgiven us. May we hunger and thirst for your righteousness until we're filled to overflowing and that in fact our lives can become broken bread and spilled out wine to nourish the souls of others as they are on their journey to find you as their very own Lord and Savior. 
We love you this day. We give you all the praise, all the glory, all the honor. And we pray this day as you taught us. What you show me, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen, amen, amen. Well, thank you so much. It's been good to be here worshiping with you. Um, love all of you so much and so excited for uh, what God is holds in store for all of us. So keep praying about next week and, and I'll give you updates as we go through and see what we can get done. And uh, amen, amen, Don. And uh, keep loving on each other, keep serving on each other, keep doing everything you can to be the living expression of Christ's love into each other's lives. All right, um, this will be uploaded on YouTube in a little bit. Um, so if you know somebody doesn't have Facebook or you want to share it, that's cool. Um, you know, the realization that I have to live with is the average time that anybody watches a video on YouTube is about 18 seconds. So I hope somewhere there was 18 seconds that were worth watching today. God bless you. I love you so much. Peace of the Lord be upon you, and I'll see you soon. Mm -hmm.